children's hearts. So we've been talking about the kingdom. I have whenever I've been up here on Sunday mornings. And um, when he asked me to speak, you know, it was one of those, uh, what are we going to talk about? And thankfully, you know, he's, God's faithful. Uh, and he reminded me during a revival of uh, something that he wanted me to say. So we're going to do it today. Uh, the blessing or the curse? We live in a, in a town that's very spiritual. And they explain things a certain way. But I want to, this morning, with God's help, bring some clarity to some issues that confuse people. And it gets them into a lot of trouble, okay? Lord God, I thank you for the word that you've given me, Lord. I ask you that right now you would be the one that speaks it, that my flesh would not get in the way, that the people would have hearts that are willing and ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 26, 2. It says, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. I would just like to say that I like to look at things in different ways. God has hidden, he talks about hiding treasure in a field. And you got to go in there and dig sometimes. And God has blessed me with some training when I was growing up in logic, whatever that's good for, but it's good for the scripture because he can show you, they're, they're truths, they're true by implication, okay? So we are going to take this verse apart and we're going to learn about the blessing and the curse today, but the, the, the proverb gives us an illustration. The bird, have, have you ever watched birds in the front yard? Especially after it rains. If you have birds in your front yard after it rains, do you know what that means? That means you have a very healthy lawn. Did you know that? You have birds in your lawn because when it rains, all the life comes to the surface. And birds, they need to eat. They go where it's readily available. So when it rains, they got the earthworms, they got all the little stuff that they can... The bird doesn't go where there's not food. I'm going somewhere. The curse causeless shall not come. The curse only comes where there's food for it. That's what he's saying. It's not just going to show up for no reason. There's a reason... That a curse is showing up. People get all oogly woogly about, oh, I'm cursed, oh, I'm this. They, no, God is a sovereign law God that has set laws in the earth. I drop something, it will fall. It's a law. You do something that feeds a curse, the curse will come. Okay, but first we got to define some terms. Okay, first one, cursed. Something that's devoted to destruction. To be cut off, hateful, detestable, or abominable. He sounds like Satan. I'd pretty say he is the curse. He is cut off. He is the abomination. He is the epitome of to be separated from God. Blessed. Something that's set apart or consecrated to a holy purpose. To make or pronounce holy. God is the blessing. I'm just saying, you know, this is, some of us is like, yeah, whatever, I've heard this before. Uh -huh. I'm not going to assume that everybody in here knows everything. Okay? Today is where I'm going to teach. Okay? So don't expect a, -ha -ha, you know, fire and brimstone or whatever. I want you to understand how the kingdom of God works. Sometimes that means getting into a little bit of nitty-gritty, but once we establish this, we're going to go someplace. So, to walk with Satan is to walk with a curse. To walk with God is to walk with the blesser. 
He is the blessing. He is what is holy. And when you walk with him, you are blessed. It sounds simple. It's, it really does. I mean, everybody hears, yeah, okay, whatever. It's not, we don't always take it so simply when we live it. When we say it, it's like, well, duh. But then we face things in life where Satan comes talking to us and we don't get the clue. Things are falling apart around us, not because we're just, we're in bad luck. We're doing something. The curse causeless cannot come. Okay? But you cannot always tell if someone is blessed or cursed by looking at their circumstances. Affliction and hardship are not the curse. Jesus gave us a promise. He said, you will suffer persecution. He didn't say you might suffer persecution. You might have some bad days. You, when you follow me, will fall, have persecution. But be of good cheer. Do you hear the difference? When you're cursed, you suffer affliction and persecution, but you have no hope. The only hope you have is one day I'm going to die and I'm going to get out of this mess. It is to suffer destruction without remedy. But the blessing is not always plenty and ease. We have an example. People in parts of the world where it's just hard to live, period. But look at their faces. They know God in a way Americans never will. They know the healing God because they don't have the doctor to go to like we do. They can't just pop a couple pills and go on their merry way. If God doesn't show up, they're dead. But they're blessed. They're more blessed in healing than many Americans are because they know the God that heals. That's the blessing. Knowing the God that blesses, not just being healed. Glorifying God and living in relationship with Him is the definition of being blessed. Okay? Now let's look at another word. Cause. Here's the kicker. That which produces an effect. That which impels into existence or by its agency or operation produces that what did not exist before. That by virtue of which anything is done. That from which any thing proceeds and without which it would not exist. Okay? So, as, as I've heard it all my life growing up. Generational curses, this curse, that curse. Oh, we have to lay hands on people to get the curse off of them. There is a cause. Why do people want there to be a curse that causes the problem instead of our life causing the issue to come in the first place. Because it's a lot easier to come up to the front, pray for the man of God, say, pray for me, get this curse off of me, but if you don't change what caused it, what's really changing? Abso well, you're making things worse, basically. Okay? So, we're getting into the logical part of it because... We can now take this statement, the curse causeless shall not come, and we can apply certain things to it. So, for example, the opposite of the curse. What's the opposite of a curse? If one statement is true, its opposite must also be true. So, if the curse causeless shall not come, that means the blessing causeless shall not come. I'm not going to be up here long, so don't worry. Turn over to Isaiah 56. Verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness is to be revealed. Blessed is that man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son be a stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord. 
Speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuch that keep my Sabbath, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of, than the, of the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted before, upon my altar, for mine house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. I don't know how much more Okay, because the definition of cursed is to be cut off. I don't know how much more cut off you can be than a eunuch. They have no life from then on. The children leaving. My daughters are now learning the principles of the Bible to carry on my life into the future. God said, you do these things, and even if you are dead, dead, you have no future, I'm going to make your name last longer than Israel's. Israel's was a chosen people. They were Abraham's seed. But God is saying, just because you're in church doesn't mean that you're walking in that relationship with me. The blessing causeless will not come. You do these things, you're going to be blessed no matter what it looks like. The curse causeless cannot come. The blessing, are you doing the, really take a look. Like I said, we are like, yeah, 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 whatever. This is uh -huh, kitty stuff. Are you walking blessed? And by blessed, I mean when the tire goes flat, do you start cursing? Or do you say, thank you, Jesus? Because whether the tire is flat or whether you're, it's not flat, you're still walking with him. My transmission went out. A stupid little transmission control module. I don't know. I mean, she's on the, the right when uh, the revival started. Literally an hour and a half before the first service. Um, I'm on the side of the road. It must be revival. <laughs> Was it a curse? We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but just because something bad happens doesn't necessarily mean, oh, the devil's at work. He's ruining my life. He can't ruin my life. He is the life. And he's in me. See, your mindset determines the outcome. Your relationship with the Father determines the outcome, not the circumstance. We all walk through circumstances. What's going to be the outcome? Are you going to end up, oh my gosh, i got to get a new car, I don't have any money, it's all broken, it's all going to fall apart, God, where are you? And I'm not making fun of people, because we've all been there. I have no idea what this, how this is going to work out. And we can, ah, why did you do this? This sounds like America. <laughs> why did you do this to us? You said we were blessed. We don't want to talk to you anymore. Yeah, that'll work real well, won't it? <laughs> but just like those birds in the front yard, can God come into your heart and find food to live? Woo! Are you cultivating a blessed lifestyle? Or do the, does the, the thoughts in your head, are they just so not blessed worthy? We're Americans. We're worthy of the blessing. We're a Christian nation. The pilgrims are Christians. Are you a Christian? And I don't mean coming to church on Sunday. I mean walking on Monday.
Psalm 22, 3 through 5. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. Do you see the progression here? God moved because they trusted. God moved because they cried. God saved because they followed him. It wasn't just because they came to the altar and cried a little bit, but then kept on going out and living like the devil. They knew that everything depended on God coming through, and they were willing to do whatever it took. Are you cultivating a blessed lifestyle? Because the blessing causeless shall not come. Not just because grandma prayed for you is God going to come through. We've been living on that way too long. Living on other people's prayers. Living on other people's relationship with God. Living like the devil and say, coming to church saying, Oh, save me, pastor! He couldn't save you the first time and he can't save you this time. So, another way that it has to be true. If the first statement is true. If the curse causeless cannot come, and the blessing causeless cannot come, neither the blessing nor the curse causeless shall be removed. I'm going to take, think about it. One day, you don't just wake up after having been cursed for a long time, and you're no longer cursed. Oh, finally, it's over. Woohoo! No. Things do not change for no reason. Okay? Take the pilgrims, for example. We're going to talk about the pilgrims. I brought them up. We're really going to talk about them this time. Why did the pilgrims pray and fast? Their relationship with God, compared to most of America's Christians today, was infinitely better. I mean, again, we're talking about people. They left everything they are on the other side of civilization, trying to live in nothing. We've heard the story, well, many of us have. They have come across, they are running low on supplies, they send to England, we need supplies, send us supplies, the ship goes, it's on its way back, and they, it's late, the ship is late. If they don't get these supplies, they will not survive the winter. Remember the story? So, what do they do? These are people who walk with God sometimes to an extreme level. Excuse me. I mean, we're talking Christians. But, but they hear, the ship's late, something's wrong. Everybody, day of fasting and prayer. Why do they do that? If they walk holy, why do they stop and pray? Because they do not assume that something has not changed, that they have not done something to change them from being blessed to walking in a curse. So I'm going to take a day. Things are looking kind of... So what are they going to do? God, I need you if I've done something, show me the sin that I've committed. We're afraid of the word repentance for some reason. Come to the front and repent. Come to the front and repent. But then people will think I've done something bad. You have! That's offensive. Are you saying I'm a sinner? Yes! We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe, if that's going through your head, the first sin you should repent of is pride. That you think you are so perfect that God has to just gloss over everything you do wrong. No, the curse causeless, I mean the blessing causeless cannot be removed. So they take a day and say, God, we repent. Because if we have now started walking in a curse, the way to stop walking in a curse, repent. 
that is... Uh, Christianity is not complicated. It's walking with God. Stephanie, we've been married for 15 years. In 15 years, I've done stuff that... And she's done stuff too, so... <laughs> but in order to keep walking in the relationship, we got to say, I'm sorry... Why do we treat God differently? Like if we go to, to repent and he just one day decides, no, I'm not going to forgive you. He's given us promises. If you confess, I am going to forgive you. And you can keep walking in the blessing. The curse and the blessing don't change by chance. They change because you change. Generational curses, we talk about that one. What is a generational curse? If you've never heard of a generational curse, uh, for example, this is just an example. Uh, grandma had diabetes. My mom had diabetes. I got diabetes. It's a generational curse of diabetes. It's convenient to blame mom and grandma on your lack of self-control with sugar. It's not a generational curse of sugar. It's a generational sin of gluttony. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be rude. But if we're going to change our lives, people are trying to... to it hurts me when I see people in positions of spiritual authority start to manipulate people, whether it's through ignorance or because they want to exercise control, that you have to come to them to get a curse taken off of your life. It's not true. You have things going on in your life? Yes, look at mom, look at grandma, but don't blame them. It's real nice. Grandma, it's your fault. If you hadn't eaten all those Twinkies when they were invented, I wouldn't be in this mess. No, Grandma taught Mom how to eat Twinkies. Mom taught you how to eat Twinkies. And now you really like Twinkies. You want to break the generational curse of diabetes? Stop eating Twinkies! Grandma was terrified of everything. My mother was, uh, what do they call it when you're afraid of getting sick all the time? Hypochondriac. Yeah, that thing. And I'm a hypochondriac. I can't help it. It's a curse of my family. Go to God. Repent. Say, I see this sin of fear. I see this sin of not trusting you. I repent, and now, God, show me how to walk out of it. That's the blessing. People who are under the curse, they are stuck in it. No way out. But God says, hey, come on up here. Come on up here. You don't got to be afraid down there, hiding in the closet because a tornado is going by. You don't got to be looking for comfort in a Twinkie. I will be your comfort. The curse that was taught to you by your mother and your grandmother cannot change until you change. Am I saying that there are not spirits that take advantage of weaknesses? No, I'm not. But when did the devil get so powerful? Last time I checked, God had all power. And when he says let go, they have to let go. Period. I have proof. Ezekiel 1. No, sorry. 18. 1. I'll summarize it for you because it's kind of long. Basically, there was this proverb that was going around in... I'll give you the verses so you can write it down and look it up. 
Ezekiel 18, 1 through 24. There was this proverb that went around Israel. said, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the son's teeth are set on edge. Basically, it was saying, dad messed up, so the son has to die. Okay? And God said, no, that is not true. If the father walks holy and the son doesn't, the son's going to die and the dad is going to be blessed. If the, if the dad walks holy and the, did I just do that one? If it switches the other way, they're blessed not by what someone before them has done. They're blessed by their walk with me. You do what is holy and you reap the benefits. You do what is evil and you reap the consequences. Is evil a, con- a blessing? A whatever. Okay. I told you I wasn't going to be up here long. This is my third and almost last point. So, last permutation. What God has cursed, no man can bless. What God has blessed, no man can curse. This is why I say, if you're experiencing what you term a curse in your life, do not come up here and expect someone to lay hands on you and get the curse off of you and everything just to be honky-dory. It doesn't come for no reason. And nobody, nobody, I don't care if it's the Pope, I don't care if it's Apostle Scott, I don't care if it's Mother Teresa, I don't care how holy you count the person. If God has said, Walk this way and you're living under a curse. There aren't enough hands in the world to be laid on you to get it off. Apostle Scott says, there isn't enough money in the world that you can dump into a program to save people from the curse when they're living in sin. Okay, Numbers 23. Seven. And he took up his parable. This is Balaam, after Balak said, Come curse Israel for me. And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, and the numbers of of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my, my last end be like his. And Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, you have blessed them altogether. You can't... I paid you good money to curse them. I can't do it. I can't do it. I want to die like them. If only I could die like the righteous, he said. You you can't curse what God has. See, are there witches? Yes. Are there bad people saying bad things all the time? Does it really matter when God has put his hand on you? No. It doesn't matter if they're like 32nd level grandmaster wizard man. (laughs) They are serving a loser. That just means they're the best loser. Because when God says you're blessed, they can kill all the goats in the world. can't touch me. I'm not saying we take it for granted. We must walk and cultivate the blessing. But when we know that we know that we know that God is with us, why should I fear what man can do to me? Even if they kill me, I still win. I don't want you to be afraid of because there's, I'm serious, there's a lot of witchcraft in Tulsa right now. And there are a lot of spiritual people 
stirring up a lot of fear about it. Real church, serve God and let the devil do his thing. You do your thing and he can't touch you. Period. Don't be afraid of the devil. Don't be afraid of the devil. He's not that strong. The only strength he has is the strength you give him. Ah, uh, that brings us John 10, 27 through 29 is another reference to him not being able to. You're, you can't take the child of God out of his hand, but you got to follow his voice. But we're going to look at another verse. Mark 12, 28. But if I cast out devils, this is Jesus speaking, by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? We often hear this in reference to uh, de demons in us or whatever, that, you know, God has to come in. But you know what? It works both ways. Like I said, if one statement must be true, its opposite must be true. If the devil cannot be spoiled unless we bind him up, God cannot be overcome unless we bind him up. Don't, hold on a second. Think about that for a minute. There isn't a strong man anywhere that can overcome God inside of you unless you bind God. How do you bind God? Oh, I would, I would love to praise you this morning, God, but I'm a little scared what people might think of me. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you, and this is true, okay? When I was growing up, I grew up in church, and we always went to spirit-filled churches, and people were always raising their hands, and they would say, raise your hands, and I'm, I, I kid you not, I know it was the devil. I would sit there, and I would want to raise my hands, but the, there would be this voice inside my head, if you do, someone's going to tickle you. It sounds stupid, but you want to know something? It worked. I don't want to raise my hand. Somebody might tickle me. God was bound in my life by my own fear. Oh, I would, I would, I would love to give him the offering this morning, but you know, the bills are a little late. You're binding God so that he can't take care of your bills. Oh, yeah, we like, oh, bind the strong man, bind the devil. Are you binding God? Because there isn't a man alive who can come in and take a house when the strong man is free. If God is free in your life to work and to move however he wants, it doesn't matter. Your house is safe. Your house is safe. I thought that was a good, uh, I was like, hey, good job, God. You know, you're pretty smart. So what is the point of all of this? Seriously, that was really, you're going to get, you're going to get to the buffet early today. <laughs> Matthew 12, 43. This is the point. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be with this wicked generation." Remember, freedom is not the absence of the curse. It is the presence of the blessing. Don't come up here, oh, deliver me, deliver me, deliver me, and walk out empty. A lot of people do it. They feel that rush of relief. Ah, oh, I feel better. I'm clean. But is your yard still full of things that invite the curse? 
or are you starting to fill your yard, your house, with the Holy Spirit? Which one are you going to choose? The blessing or the curse? This may be, seem like an elementary, but it's fundamental. Nothing that you do for the rest of your life will ever escape that question. Who are you feeding? Every situation you find yourself in, you will come back to that. Do I choose God or do I choose the devil? And it might not even be like neon lights. That's the devil. Hey, hey. It could just be I'm afraid of lifting my hands because I might get tickled. It seemed very logical at the time. And I missed out on years of a blessing. I would offer you to come up for prayer, but it won't do you any good. I can offer you to come up to pray. Because this has nothing to do with me and you. It has everything to do with you and him.